Uh, good day to you wherever you are and welcome to today's uh, broadcast on NTN, a special uh, press conference slash discourse on uh, the fact that we have embarked on as of the 1st of August or the 31st of July for that matter, the month of observance of emancipation activities in St. Lucia for 2022, Emancipation Month 2022, uh, which has been designated as the first of three months over three years. Uh, so for the entire month of August uh, in 2022, as well as in 2023 and 2024, thanks to uh, the government of St. Lucia having so designated uh, last year, uh, there will be Emancipation Month for each of the three years and why an emancipation month and not just emancipation day like we have celebrated all our lives we will hope to uh, explain the background to that uh, during today's um, discussion as well as putting emancipation within uh, a proper or should we say as much as a historical context as we can from the standpoint uh, that as we will know by now uh, emancipation day was designated a holiday on the first of august for as long as all of us who are alive can remember uh, but the reasons for which it was declared a holiday um, would have had different meaning for those who declared it a holiday and those it was meant for, the enslavers and the enslaved. So these are issues um, uh, that will allow us uh, to look at over a one month period, emancipation from all of the aspects. Look at all the varying narratives insofar as what it was meant to be, what it actually was, why it is still being observed, why, St. Lucia and all of the CARICOM and all of the uh, former British um, uh, colonies are observing Emancipation uh, Day, which is observed on a different day in the uh, French uh, territories, former French territories, um, including the current uh, French colonies in the Caribbean by a, another name of overseas departments, including the Dutch, the so-called Dutch Antilles uh, and Suriname, um, as well as as the U.S. Virgin Islands, the British Virgin Islands, and the U.S. mainland itself, where emancipation in Europe was at a different dates than in the United States. So our panel today is going to look to uh, avail us of uh, the opportunity to look at all of the above. And to introduce our panelists, uh, we have Monsignor Dr. Patrick A. B. Anthony, and uh, many people don't uh, know what the A and the B is about. I cannot quite remember, but what I will tell you is that um, the name Pava is not just a nickname. It is P. Patrick A. B. Anthony. And so um, it is not a nickname. It is actually his name, and that's why um, he has no problem being called uh, Pava. So um, Monsignor Anthony is... For all intents and purposes, the founding father, no pun intended, the founding father of the Folk Research Center. Um, others describe him as the patron, others describe him as the honorary chair, others describe him as a founding member. But all of that is Papa, who is going to be with us. And um, earlier this month, or towards the end of last month, we um, celebrated a special day in his mission uh, as a man of the cloth, as a priest, as a monsignor, and we will be looking at that as well, but he will be uh, looking mainly at the uh, development of the Folk Research Center and the activities of the Folk Research Center within the context of what we are observing, St. Lucia history. Uh, so we will be hearing from Monsignor Anthony who will have to leave with us to uh, undertake 
um, activities, a particular activity, um, which is a mass at uh, 12.30. So he will be leaving us before uh, that time. Uh, also with us is uh, Madam Lily Ching Soto. She is the head of the National OAS office in St. Lucia. And uh, she is here because she will be able to share with us the fact that uh, emancipation, reparations, and uh, all related activities are not only restrained to CARICOM and former British uh, colonies, but it is uh, something which is observed and has a relationship to Latin America and the Caribbean, South America and the Caribbean within the context of the organization of American states, which unites all of those regions in one body and which has by itself undertaken in many different ways to observe uh, the uh, activities having to do with uh, people of African descent and the fact that we need to always put slavery in its historical context. And the OAS has been participating here uh, ever since uh, uh, Madame Soto arrived. And in fact, August 1st, Emancipation Day has uh, uh, some personal, um, uh, personal importance to her, which I'm sure she will share with us. And uh, our other presenter today is Drenia Frederick, the creative director of uh, the Cultural Development Foundation, which is playing the leading role in the organization of activities having to do with Emancipation Month uh, 2022. And uh, therefore, um, Drenia has really been going with it and at it um, for as long as the National Planning Committee of Stakeholders has been meeting uh, for quite some time. So Drenia today will be able to share with us um, what has been done, what the responses has been, and to what extent her committee is encouraged or discouraged or both uh, by the reaction so far, bearing in mind that we are still on the only the third day of August and our activities will go to the end of August uh, and end with a big bang on August 30th. And if you don't know what August 30th is, Jenya will be able to tell us. So folks, um, that is an outline and um, we will start with uh, Monsignor Anthony. And um, welcome, Monsignor. Thank you, Earl. Thank you. And um, we have invited you, like I said, for several reasons. Mm -hmm. um, your preeminent founding role in the development of the Folk Research Center, now the Monsignor Patrick Anthony Folk Research Center. Mm -hmm. And um, my basic first question will be from the standpoint uh, that for decades after the establishment of the FRC, could you tell us whether it has achieved its objective? And within that context, placing the experience of FRC in promoting quail with the experience that we are going through now in taking Emancipation Day from an annual holiday to go to the beach for a picnic mm -hmm. to what um, has been happening ever since um, the 1st of August. So over to you, Monsignor. Yes, um, thanks, thanks, sir. Welcome, um, viewers and listeners. The, I think the parallel between the development of the Focus Center and the emancipation <coughs> process celebration that we're having now it's, it's, it's quite interesting because, see, when we started the Focus at Center, we began to talk about St. Lucian identity, St. Lucianness. We began to talk about our African heritage and Amerindian and other St. Lucian elements that came to form. People said, what's, what's this you're talking about? What are they into? <laughs> you know? So it was something very novel. It was something for just a few people who were in, into it. In fact, prior, prior to our systematic study of St. Lucian culture, other person had been doing research. Um, and this is why somebody like Harold Simmons, who we, we, we consider the spiritual father of St. Lucian culture, had been doing research into St. Lucian culture. People like Eric Branford had been with, with, with him. 
And um, so you, you had a number of persons involved. Romelia Elwin, okay? Joyce August. Those persons um, they were, were collecting St. Lucian. Winville King. Win, Win, Win King and so They were collecting data on St. Lucian culture. They were trying to do programs on it, you know, sort of on radio and so forth, trying to involve the wider public in an understanding of the richness of the, of the world that we had. I mean, the Walcott brothers had used the, the heritage. I mean, you know, Roddy Walcott with all of his plays, using the traditions that rose the Marguerite and so forth, to again bring it from Little Corner into the public domain. You see? But what, what we did when, when, when I came back to St. Lucia was to take the work that um, Harold Simmons was doing in terms of research, you, you, you see, to a different level. Because Harry was really the first both what called scientific researcher who saw that the data must be not just collected but also analyzed and somehow publicized. And so when we came and started the Study in Action Group, Black Studies Group, and eventually the Focus at Center, our, our emphasis was on the whole idea of researching, scientific research so that we can document and we can share, and we can critique, and we can understand, we can, so, so the, that, that was the role of the focus. And that's why it's called Folk Research Center. Always come on the research. So you get the material, and you work with it. You do productions, you can do, you know, the people doing songs you know, on this <coughs> in those days and so forth. Yeah, you produce stuff, you know, you can use it for plays and so, you can write about it. So, but the research, grounded in what have you discovered? And, of course, what we're discovering was that we, we were who we were, but we did not know who we really were. <laughs> we don't know ourselves, you know? So we, we took it for granted. I mean, the, the older people had all this rich, 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 rich resource of, you know, memory, you know, wisdom in our proverbs, in our stories, you know, the, the, the tremendous tradition of the Chatwell, somehow be, being involved in the society, trying to affect social behavior through their music. I mean, all of that stuff was happening. But it was never studied in a scientific way and used for research. And this is why the Focus Center decided that one of the mission, primary mission focus center was to study St. Lucian culture as a tool for development. <laughs> And we've always been strong on that. That culture must be an instrument for national development. Because the, the concept of development that people had in those days was purely economics. <laughs> you know? Money, trade, th th these kind of things like that. And we're saying that this now. We're bringing a new understanding of development. That development was not just about money, trade, and development was about people. <laughs> It's about people. So if you're talking about development, and you're talking about people, then you have to know the people. And if you, if you, to know the people, you have to study them. That's where the question of language came in, you, you know? You, you, have to, you have to hear, you have to listen to people. But if you don't know their language, you will not understand what they're saying. And of course, all of that brought us into that process that today has, you know, become what we know as a focus and center. But you see, the parallel of the whole emancipation um, celebration process is that when we started, we're just a small group, a group of students and teachers, hmm? she interested, and we began to do our work, and to do our work, put on radio, doing programs on radio and so forth, publishing in The Voice and, and the, the Crusade and those things like that. But it was still small. We were touching people sort of tangentially on the margins and whatnot, but we had not become what we might call a mass movement. And that, 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 that journey from a small group doing research to becoming a movement that is of national significance, that can impact a nation, would only come decades later when we got into the whole question of Creole and the use of Creole and the establishment of Juni Creole and realizing that somehow the people 
had to embrace the creolity, the creole identity as part of the St. Lucianess. And then we began to celebrate, celebrate it. And you know, it is remarkable when we had our first little Junior Creole, it was a radio thing, <laughs> you know? Then, then we tried to do a little something in Monrepo with Sesen and so forth. And people, uh, yeah, 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 then people talking about culture, about play, all language and whatnot. Eh? Eh, today, look at that. The most massive single cultural event that is most inclusive <laughs> in terms of participation. And you know, the thing about it is that it, it, it's, it's a remarkable phenomenon. But when you think of in St. Lucia, if you're the carnival, there are a whole set of students who have learned the carnival. So it's not inclusive. <laughs> you, 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 you take Christmas. Yeah. A whole set of people say, we don't celebrate <laughs> our religion, don't, you know? But you take June Creole. That everybody of every race, creed, religion that is involved, you know? And so that's over 40 years. Mm -hmm. It took a long time. So what we're starting this year, when you see CDF and FRC and events and so forth coming, starting, we've just started. The skin can mushroom. <laughs> it will mushroom, it will become a mass movement, and the same process that we are now trying to get people to move that. Creole is not just a, a language, it is a way of life, it is self-understanding, it is a development process. That must happen also too, and I'm confident it will happen with the concept of emancipation. Not just a, a word emancipation, not just a holiday we're celebrating now, but now that we're going to begin to look into the research, do our history, do, do our, um, understand our ancestors, understand what's what, the whole question of reparation. You know? I mean, the thing has potential, potential, potential. So, I mean, CDF and Drain and them have developed a three-year three plan, but, but it's, it's going to be much more than three years. I mean, women three years, then you'll have to just, because it's, this thing has potential, potential to really mushroom. And especially with, with, um, if you have uh, policy makers, politicians, who have the consciousness, that's the important thing. They have the consciousness and can put the resources, both finance and other resources, to facilitate the thing. It has its own dynamism. It's going to take off. <laughs> you know, you know when, when you hear St. Lucians who were always proud in the diaspora of speaking their Creole as a way of giving them some sense of identity. <coughs> When you hear now, when something like La Rosa La Marguerite, St. Lucian communities all over the world <laughs> celebrating that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what they, you know, when Junior Clock, oh my gosh, all, all over the world, you, mm -hmm. you know? And the same thing for me, as what's going to happen with emancipation, you know? It's going to just take off and blossom and become a fantastic movement for social transformation and social reengineering. I think it's definitely one of the tools that can help us. The whole question of crime and so forth, you know? You, you know? When people can understand that we were nurtured in the society of violence, you know? We, we, we were enculturated into becoming, vi be, be, becoming violent people because people, violence was done to us, and therefore we became resistant to violence. And then we got, I mean, all of those, the, the psychological, psychosocial things. In, I mean, there's so much, so much, so much, you know? Thank you so much, uh, Monsignor Dr. Patrick Anthony, uh, who has been able to, as we were hoping, uh, put uh, the growth, development, and consolidation of the Folk Research Center within the context, a uh, historical context, and as he has uh, pointed out, the experience with introduction of Creole and June Creole and the need to appreciate Creole activities uh, was a process uh, that was galvanized as fast as people became to, uh, started to understand uh, the relationship. But our, uh, our next uh, presenter, and of course, in case you joined us late, uh, this is a, a special press conference organized by the St. Lucia National 
Reparations Committee, uh, which has been working with the CDF as part of a, a committee of stakeholders um, that is driving the process under the leadership of the CDF, the Ministry of uh, Tourism and Creative Industries, on the basis of uh, the contribution of the government of St. Lucia and the designation of the Cabinet of Ministers of the month of August 2022 as the first Emancipation Month. And participating in our activities, uh, not only now, but from as far back as March, as far as I can remember, during the observance of the week of activities against and in memory of um, the, the slave trade and uh, in terms of letting us remember that uh, slavery was not only uh, the worst crime against humanity as designated by the United Nations in 2001, but also uh, that slavery, uh, like uh, the Holocaust, should never happen again. And uh, the Organization of American States uh, participated in our activities here in March. In fact, um, one of them included a presentation uh, by the principal of this Arthur Lewis Community um, College who made a stolen presentation on the origins of carnival and the fact that carnival is not just a jump up uh, matter. He put it in historical context. And that activity was blessed by a presentation uh, by the Secretary General of the Organization of American States which had contributed uh, to the activity and also present was uh, uh, Madam Lily uh, Ching Soto, the uh, head of the National OAS office, uh, who is our next presenter and will tell us what uh, the OAS is doing in so far as our recognition of Emancipation Month uh, 2022. But perhaps, Madam Ching, you could start off with, um, um, I understand that there's a, August 1st means more to you than just. Uh, I will uh, take that bait and I will uh, <laughs> and I will share the fact that I did come to St. Lucia on August 1st, uh, 2019. So okay. it was my third year anniversary, two days ago, um, <laughs> in St. Lucia and, and I have quite enjoyed it. Um, Happy anniversary. Thank you. Very very much. <laughs> I must also tell you, and I and I really, I'm really grateful for being here. Thank you for the invitation. And I also should tell you that when I came here for some years, I started reading about St. Lucia on Saturdays. But and when you were speaking about research, I was doing research about St. Lucia. But this year, I must tell you that I have been able to soak in St. Lucia's culture in a completely different way. So I think that I would like to start by saying that the events that CDF has been organizing have been the, the power that these initiatives have into expressing and transferring cultural heritage is amazing. And I am really proud of being part of it and to be able to support CDF and the government of San Lucia and of course to bring the organizational support into the events that we're carrying out this month. And um, I did, I hope, um, give justice to OAS's participation in the activities in March. Um, perhaps you could um, fill us in on anything I might have left out in terms of the extent of, uh, of your participation, um, the contribution of your Secretary General, and uh, how you fit into, how your office fits into Emancipation Month this year. Well, let me start by saying that the OAS, the Organization of American States, is the world's oldest organization. And we work through different pillars, including development, democracy, human rights, security. So between the human, and I have a human rights background as well. So I was very interested in promoting equality, non-discrimination. And when we um, were celebrating in March the Inter-American Week for People of African Descent, we decided to do something that was going to go a little bit beyond the words and the discussions and the panels. We have so many panels in Washington. We have so many discussions. And from the diplomatic perspective, we thought that maybe it would be more effective to have a visual arts competition in which we could invite St. Lucians to bring their art related to Afro-descendant 
And not only to, the, and it was because we were celebrating, well, we were commemorating um, anti-slavery trade, but we wanted to focus not only on the, on the bad part of, of, of the commemoration, but we wanted to focus on the strength and, and the resilience of persons of African descent. And also by doing that, and, and for me to be able to be a better bridge between Washington and St. Lucia, and I think that very early when we met, I told you, my intention is that St. Lucia feels always closer, um, that, the, that the OAS is present, that we're here, we're working um, more than trying to bring St. Lucia more to Washington, right? And, and the idea, to me, it's um, very exciting to think about being able to support all these cultural activities that would allow us to support the country, to support your cultural heritage. And that's why one day with Dr. Nurse, we decided to speak not, not only to have the visual arts competition, but also give it an academic component, which was to be able to speak about Carnival. And uh, that lecture about Carnival, I am very proud of it. <laughs> um, I think that Dr. Nurse was able to bring to the table. Dr. The, Keith Nurse, the yes, principal. Dr. Nurse, the principal of Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. Um, because our activities have started in collaboration with Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. Um, he was able to bring a lot of substance into the discussion. And it's, uh, to me, it was really valuable. Staff of the OES in headquarters and the rest of the national offices were invited to participate, to listen to this. And it's really valuable to bring San Lucia to the OES because understanding what Carnival is, and I must tell you that I went to all the events and I enjoyed them. <laughs> but um, to understand what Carnival is from a completely different perspective, the perspective of knowing what does it mean, what is the cultural heritage, in addition to, to the feds and, and everything else, I think was wonderful. And we had the support from the highest level of authorities in, in Washington, which is the Secretary General, speaking about how the carnivals do give voice to the marginalized, and, and they're a space for freedom of expression. So we started with that this year. Uh, and I think that I must tell you that when you speak about the commemoration this month, or when we speak about celebrations, I would really want to go beyond the month. Uh, and my idea and, and what we would like to do is to support St. Lucia, St. Lucia's, the St. Lucian government, to be able to hold those conversations on a permanent basis. You know, we take, um, we take the opportunity of celebrate or commemorate, but I think that the discussions should be ongoing, that, um, that we should continue having these conversations on, on a regular basis and to, and to, in my particular case, I'm really interested in making sure that the OES is effective and useful for San Lucia. Now, continuing with March, um, we brought the um, art competition all the way to April, or May even, and then we had an art exhibition, and I think it was wonderful. Um, we still have some in the social media. We had a very strong participation of, of St. Lucian artists, and I appreciate it very much because I think we started a conversation, and I've said this before, a conversation beyond words. We started walking the talk via arts, via culture, via incentivizing young and not so young um, in, in representing the cultural heritage, which is very important in order to, to, to promote that nationalism. And I say that from, from the perspective of a multicultural, multilateral organization. Mm -hmm. But so with the art exhibition, then we decided that we should continue for emancipation because the topics are, are absolutely related, right? It's, it's impossible not to think about one without the other. But to continue with emancipation and, and, and the best part of what we're doing now to me is that we shift the focus from slavery trade into a focus of positive rekind rekindling consciousness mm -hmm. <laughs> into a focus of into a different perspective so i would say from a from a negative concept of slavery to a positive em embrace of freedom and emancipation and um, 
And with that, we decided to collaborate with everybody who would be on board with the, with the art exhibition and bring it to the South. You know, so that we could not only be in Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, not only be in the <coughs> north, but also to bring it to the south and be able to share some of this and try to engage people in, in to participating in cultural events as well. So that's where we are now. If you want, we can talk about the future as well. <laughs> uh, but the, the idea is that we have this exhibition in Beaufort and also the OES. Uh, today I started my day by visiting the, the Human Resource Center, I think that's the name of it, in Grosilia, where there is an art exhibition and we, and we went and we supported it. We went to the Breadfruit and Breadnut Festival before we came here. So, you know, we are here. Um, I want to be I want to be understood as part of the tribe. I want you to know that I am working to bring in oh yes closer to San Lucia and that these initiatives have an immense power. And as I told you from my readings on Saturdays, to leave in the experience of carnival to the drums and, and dance even though it was 4 a.m., um, just experience to see the capacity and, and the power that there is it's very inspiring. Now, we have next week, um, you know, we started, and I'm not gonna say that we're closing the loop because I really want to keep the line of continuity, but mm -hmm. next week we have, and it's also part of the celebrations with emancipation, we have uh, August 9th as Indigenous Peoples, um, Indigenous Persons we, uh, Day, and we'd we'll like to extend some of the celebrations to the week, you know, the, the OAS is celebrating the Inter-American Week for Indigenous Peoples, and I think that the topic goes very well with some of the art exhibitions that we have. So um, after this, I have to speak with, with Ms. Drenia here. <laughs> but uh, the idea would be to also, you know, embrace that and to be able to continue the conversation. No, precisely, and um, we're glad that um, the OAS not only has assisted in uh, contributing to the narrative on slavery, from slavery to emancipation, but also uh, looking at uh, World Indigenous Day and how it can be observed. Because, folks, um, the the. CARICOM Reparations Commission, which was appointed uh, by CARICOM heads of government in 2013, and which gave rise to the establishment of national reparations committees in 12 CARICOM countries, including uh, St. Lucia. The mandate of the NRC in St. Lucia and all of uh, the other 11 member states in uh, CARICOM is to ensure uh, that the undertaking that was given by heads of government when they adopted the call uh, for joint pursuit of reparations uh, for slavery and native genocide. We tend not to remember the native genocide part of it, and we will be discussing uh, that during uh, the uh, Emancipation Month in August, because one of the uh, things we are doing as part of the National Committee, uh, the the National Reparations Committee has a 100-day plan, independent of a separate 100-day plan uh, that the CDF has, which uh, our next presenter will bring us up to date with. Uh, but the activities that we are taking to the table are activities that are not necessarily on uh, the national uh, program as yet, but activities which will be taking place during that month, inescapable observances like uh, Madam Soto has just pointed out, the 9th of August, uh, next week, Friday, is uh, going to be uh, observed internationally as the International Day for Indigenous People. Uh, the 30th of August, Jania will tell you what is going to happen on the 30th of August, where we will be closing with the uh, Emancipation <coughs> Month. But the 31st of August is also recognized by the United Nations as International Day for People of African Descent. And one can 
can see the CDF as well uh, being willing and able to participate in the activity that NRC has organized for that day, which will include regional participation, including by uh, hopefully the president of the Caribbean Organization of Indigenous People, who will put into context the intrinsic connection between the freedom fighters who resisted slavery earlier in, in our history and the first people who the Europeans met and who also put up resistance uh, to their lands being stolen because land title is uh, one of the major issues affecting all uh, indigenous uh, people uh, people of indigenous descent uh, across the world as manifested by the Pope's uh, one week visit to uh, Canada last week which he aptly described as a pilgrimage of penance. Uh, so our next uh, presenter is Jenya Frederick. She is the creative director of the Cultural Development Foundation and in the driving seat in terms of implementation of uh, the agreement program of activities which like I said earlier didn't only start on the 1st of August it started with the formal launching of the uh, program uh, in July and um, there was an activity on the last day of July which many people saw as an appropriate introduction to August 1st so um, to take us through where we have come from where we are and give us a glimpse on where we're heading with the rest of Emancipation Month uh, 2022. Jenia Frederick. Good morning, everybody. Um, um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And um, I think Papa said something that is significant. Two things. This is a movement, and this is about social change. And um, so far, well, this emancipation process started months ago. And um, when we were charged by the Prime Minister to, to come up with something, and um, the Minister um, of Tourism, Ernest Hillier, to come up with something, he said, come up with something big. And um, it took CDF a couple of months to really come up with those events. We were not looking at it in the perspective of person say, oh, another kind of large event but how do you take an event and transmit a message how do you take an event and reach your people and how do you take an event and really enkindle um, the consciousness of St. Lucians and uh, cause us to awake to the reality of our past look at ourselves in the present and look towards what is to come in the future so the three-year plan is really working on that awareness and allowing people to come face to face with whether you want to call it or not the reality of uh, a slave past being enslaved the reality of maybe the effects of it today and how we can change the trajectory for the future and we started off with developing what we call iconizing a hero of emancipation. And our hope is to have a hero from each district because um, slavery was spread around St. Lucia. And there are many stories like that. So we started off in Denry, iconizing Petruni. Now I first came across the name um, from, I heard it from Dr. Winston Philogens when I was looking for and researching for someone to iconize in Denry. And then subsequently to that, I read Dr. Sumar's paper, it's Stiff Back Women. And from since that point, um, that story has really stuck out. And it's significant because most people don't realize that there was resistance before um, emancipation was officially um, announced by um, the British Empire. And there was slave resistance in St. Lucia during that period. And what is significant and interesting to note is that most of the resistance was led by women. 
And um, this is an important point. This is an important focal point because it does say something about St. Lucian women and how, to some extent, they hold the society together. And for me, Petroni, and when we looked at her, um, one person created that massive change and shift in terms of how people were treated. And it's through the, the, the almost the sacrifice of her death that certain things changed. So I mean, the story of Petroni is simple. Um, Baron du Bocage said he didn't know what to do with her. I think she had gone through every single punishment. And she died on her own terms. They stirred a riot and the case brought to court an inquisition to declare that no woman should be put in a pillory. And this is a woman from Denry, the valley. And to have persons in that community come face to face with their history. At door. We come face to face with their history in terms of the type of metal that they are made of is quite is quite a feat and significant. So Sunday, we started off with a parade, and I must say that the Rastafarian community has been very supportive. We all know that they had been leading and holding the, the charge of emancipation, and they came out in large numbers, uh, joined the parade, and um, we'd like to thank Empress Dani for that in particular, and her leadership in terms of how that was structured. Um, I think she she herself is a formidable woman and um, and so we were accompanied by um, a cultural groups in Denry, um, Montego Bay's solo and of course this group called More Fire um, with those long French horns and drums and when we came to the area just in front of the, the schools and when I got there and we saw the, 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 the crowd of people waiting to unveil this billboard and the whole process of really identifying what the history is persons coming up and speak passionately and then having our officials our government officials unveil this billboard and seeing the reaction of persons in the community i mean it was a moment in time of recognition that this is one of ours this is somebody that is significantly ours this is something where it's something in us that allows us to realize that we have the ability to make a statement, stand up for what is right, and empower ourselves. So the billboard is really about empowerment, empowering a community, empowering women, empowering St. Lucians. And moving to the concert area where people had this sense of jubilation, celebration. And what we try to do is when you go into a community, you don't enforce your ideology upon them. You take their ideas and what they want to do. Most of the performances and performers were from Denry, the community. And um, there were even remarks, people say, all of this talent in this one, this one area um, use persons in the community to help in the um, setup of the area. So it was really about us working with the community, both the Denry North and South Council, um, um, working through that those relationships. I can't say that it has been easy all the time. We have disagreements, but just working towards that common goal and setting it up. So I have to say thank you to um, Crescendo, Wilfred, Michael Landers, Arlene Regis for their support in bringing this thing to life. And um, without their support and the support of the entire community of Denry, um, allowing Petroni to come to life. So within that um, fair, the, the concert was overloading with people. And it was just a period of coming together and a celebration and understanding that this this is who we are and in a sense as a community and as St. Lucians and bringing together all of those groups of people together towards creating one one sort of format, one goal. So, so, so for CDF, in terms of achieving that, 
that is significant and important. And the Emancipation Committee, all of those persons who made up that committee in terms of really latching on to the vision, because it's important for persons. You may have an idea and a vision and nobody seems to understand, but understanding the vision, understanding the purpose, um, hats off to everybody on the Emancipation Committee and the community of Denry. And within that sense, that for me bridged the success that, that we wanted in terms of finally that trigger to awaken people. Uh, when you go down the highway and you see that billboard, you take two, three seconds and you, raise, you say, Petroni, mm -hmm. this person is, is, is significant. This is my hero. And um, so we want to continue that. In terms of Sufre, before I get to Sufre, the drums and dance ritual, this was primarily designed to allow people to interface with aspects of our history and understand the context of emancipation, I would say on a spiritual level, and take aspects of our culture that connect to it. If you notice the parade, um, people ask, oh boy, why 4 a.m. in the morning? <laughs> but think about it. The enslaved probably got up at 3 a.m. in the morning, a little before that, and spent hours from sunrise to sunset um, toiling and really and truly, they did not have the liberty to say, I could stay in my bed at 4 a.m. It's just one um, day out of the year. You make that pilgrimage, you make that sacrifice to show respect come out of your comfort and be come part out of your sleeping <laughs> zone. <laughs> yes. And be part of the celebration. And there were two reasons why it had to happen early in the morning. So I'll give you a technical reason why. So it's that spiritual connection when you're awake. So that parade is coming down and it's bursting into daylight. So that is one effect of that reverence the parade coming down the road, and the parade is aspects of our culture that we have sort of developed, whether you call it through creolization, over the years. The stilt walkers has significant spiritual connection in terms of deities. So you have that element. Um, you have elements of that we have taken from our carnival to show the connection between that. Um, all of the performers, the dancers, all of that embodies who we are. And um, we're hoping the general public would join, come in your African way, and to ensure that that continues. And um, I will come back to you on this, but as we indicated earlier, Monsignor has to leave us uh, about now. Um, so we would have to give him the opportunity to briefly tell us in Creole what he said in English, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll take a break so that he could um, uh, make his exit. Um, do you know Paul Paba? A Creole, a poison. Eh bien, ça, ça m'a été expliqué tout à l'heure, c'est ça. Mais nous commençons à travailler là, nous avons pu être focus sur le centre de l'Ordia. C'était un grand de garçons de l'école, um, c'est Mary's College, et puis il y a des gens qui viennent ensemble. Et puis nous avons été intéressés à étudier, à faire des recherches à ce qu'il y a ici. Mais il n'y a pas une façon de faire des recherches avant. Puisque la deuxième personne qui est allée, elle a étudié ses traditions, elle a servi pour elle savoir, elle a fait chanter, mais elle a chanté à son radio et comme ça. Mais nous, 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 ça, qu'il est important pour le développement. Je veux dire, qu'il n'y a pas un bagage pour nous danser, chanter, comme vous voyez, là, tu peux te risquer à venir. Non, non. Qu'il est sans outil. Sans outil. Puisque qu'il est sans outil, il est apporté la sagesse, ce peuple-là. Il a apporté l'âme peuple, il a apporté l'assistance peuple. Et puis, l'on comprend ça. Vous comprenez Si il y a des outils qui a vraiment poussé le développement, laisse ça là. La qualité de développement de l'intérieur de service avant ça. Pas de point ça. Pas de service ça, pas de l'utiliser. Puisqu'il a parlé de développement. C'était à nous mettre Belgique, hein, pour maison. On nous parlait de l'argent, business, et bien comme ça. Ou à chaque six mois. Ou à chaque six mois. Mais nous avons dit, oui, 
tout ça, c'est développement. Mais ça qui est plus important, le développement, c'est le peuple. C'est le peuple. Sous le peuple, là, on pas de développement. Pour ça, travaillez-nous. C'est pour nous ça, oui, la science, elle a un valeur qu'il dit qu'on a un outil pour le développement. Et puis c'est ça nous pousser en tout travail nous et nous quand ouais manière faut que je te développer nous commencer il y en a tout le monde les nous les nous tu as fait quoi yol là mon gars j'ai gars avec quoi yol pas 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 ça là ça là si ça pas 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 25 ans, oui, 25 ans l'année qui passe. La partie des pièces, pareil comme je ne peux pas, à celle ci Avant tout ça, la partie des Mais nous commençons bien un mouvement créole. Il développe la célébration. La célébration a grandi. Nous avons commencé à dans une petite place, on ne La deuxième année a entré. Place à trop petit, nous tenons pour garder la police, mais nous tenons Et que nous pensons qu'il a grandi, qu'il a grandi, qu'il a grandi. Juste nous tenons pour sortir dans nos communautés, puisque toute communauté est venue, nous tenons pour choisir, nous pensons qu'il a choisi des communautés. Après ça, nous avons dit, non, non, ça va assez, nous nous dit, allez pour trois communautés, nous allons pour quatre communautés, juste nous avons dit, nous avons dit, national. Moi, un mois. Pas un jour, mais un mois. Un mois, un mois. Et puis, pour moi, ça c'est même ça me qu'elle qu'il fait. Et puis, ça fait émancipation. Nous ne pouvons pas dire libération, non. Nous ne pouvons pas dire un mouvement. Un jour, une célébration, nous tenons longtemps. Nous ne aller au plat, bas, sous le but de la au plat, ça Ça est venu un mouvement. Et là, il est un mouvement. Côté, nous ne pouvons pas l'histoire. Nous ne pouvons pas ça y est, ça technologie. Hein? Les gens qui ont apprécié la qualité de la qualité de la qualité de la qualité de la violence de la qualité de la qualité nous la qualité de 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 la Violence, c'est un bagage qui est en haut. Quoi, nous n'y pouvons pas comprendre ça en psychologiquement. Hein? Quoi, le mouvement qui commence à faire ça, quand il y a des sociétés, pour nous comprendre ça, pour nous comprendre comme nous, et pour moi, il faut se transformer. Quand il y a des transformations, nous ne pouvons pas parler pour les sociétés. Il faut venir et puis conscience. Regardez, 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 côté Rastaï à présent. Même pas avec ça. Là où c'est point, c'est la mettre devant le gouvernement de la gouvernement. C'est le développement. C'est ça qu'on va le développement. Ça c'est un process. Un mouvement qui a développé. L'année prochaine finit, l'année après, la réunion, les gens sont sortis tout partout. Vous venez célébrer. Et ma Merci pour la parole, Papa, Monseigneur. Merci. Merci. Padre. Merci. 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 And uh, we will continue our discussion with the creative director of the Cultural Development Foundation and the head of the National Office of the Organization of American States in St. Lucia, Madam Lily Ching Soto. We will be right back. She's been watching, waiting, wondering when the sands of time will give way to a tide of change and for yesterday and today to become a new tomorrow. 
for a time when her son can kiss the cheeks of your loved one and her stars can twinkle in her honeymoon skies. When her earthly embrace will reassure and calm your soul. And her unique view can change your whole perspective. Proudly, she has risen to meet new challenges and to provide safe harbor to all who reach her shores. For her hopes and dreams still stand shoulder to shoulder, a precious reminder of experiences yet to come. So, wherever your moments and memories take you, let her sense of adventure set you free. She is Saint Lucia. climate is changing and that affects all of us. Storms are becoming increasingly intense. Periods of intense drought and heavy rain stress farm animals and destroy our crops. Higher average ocean temperatures kill our coral reefs and change the migratory patterns of fish. St. Lucia contributes only 0.0015% of global greenhouse gas emissions, but is doing its part along with countries around the world to reduce the emissions that are warming our world and changing our climate. These efforts are called mitigation. But decades of emissions have already changed the climate and the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere today will increase average global temperatures even more. We need to adapt, that is, do everything we can to prepare for and respond to the actual and expected negative effects of climate change. And everyone has a role to play. We need to protect our crops, build homes that withstand storms, and keep our drains and waterways free of garbage to help us recover or bounce back from climatic events. Learn more about the Government of St. Lucia's National Adaptation Plan and the steps you can take to protect yourself and your fellow St. Lucians. St. Lucia has been in Corona and has been a movement and a shaivy test chaque canef ka kouye pou vilijans publik la fe wolou pale an plas publik kon bol an me baz, ti boutik chonje distans sosyal sis pie rod yon alot i ka twa vaitan si ou santi ko ou pa kodyal quarantine ko ou pa twe an kontak epi lot an ka ou te twa pe espoze. Se an nekouye, free one one ou ben ne pot klinik yo pe ou. Le pe yi a di mi a kle, sa vle di, le supermarket, famasi, e pi etiem, yo aksesab avan se te twe. Pe yi a kle an plen, sa vle di, tout bagay fe me a ven katwe. Se vi protokol kom soti pa biwo indikasyon sante. Nou tout ansam sa sove ve min korona si nou tout sevi jid la a tout le. Se gya 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 swing this one Se tou chabi a soldier together we can beat this gara What's in the food you're eating Do you really even know All the chemicals and hormones used to accelerate their growth All the artificial flavoring, sweeteners and colors too We consume and we don't spare a thought for the damage that they'll do No, think about the children Welcome back to our press conference discourse discussion on the observance of Emancipation Month 2022 in St. Lucia and we have heard uh, from uh, Monsignor Dr. Patrick Anthony. Uh, we have also heard uh, from Madam Lili Ching Soto, the head of the OAS office, national office in St. Lucia. And uh, just at our break, 
before our break, we were hearing from Jrenia Frederick, the CDF Cultural Development Foundation's creative director. And um, Jrenia, you were telling us about the positive response on the last day of July uh, to the launching mm -hmm. of the, uh, the, the, the Petronil uh, activity in January. Um, the unveiling of her plaque, her picture, her image, whatever we might want to call it, um, you have in fact been making reference to the fact that, um, you know, we used to drive around four door up and down. Um, we just consider we live in Denry to head for, head for Miku, but the location of uh, that uh, monument will encourage people and has already started encouraging people to think about not just who she was and how nice she was, but the contribution that her death made to the changing of the way in which women mm -hmm. were punished uh, during slavery. Because as Zunia pointed out, uh, Ambassador Suma's research and that of others has indicated that she died in something called a pillory. And a pillory was like a cage in which you are put with your head outside at the top, your hands tied behind your back. And that is done in public, in a yard, to bring a, a, a measure of public shame to the person for having sinned by just being rude or refusing to take orders like Petronil. And because of the way in which she was able to influence uh, other enslaved people, both men and women, uh, she ran away. Uh, they were punishing her and she ran away. And eventually she was caught, put in the pillory, and she died. Now, having died on the morning in 1833, remember that's before emancipation, the Baron de Bocage, like we heard earlier, who was the overseer at the, uh, uh, at the Fordor estate, they claimed that she strangled herself. Now remember, her head was outside the cage, her hands were tied behind her back, but they claimed she strangled herself. So that issue went to the courts, and insofar as um, justice, quote-unquote, in those days was concerned, the change it brought about was that women would no longer be punished in the pillory, except until, unless, there was somebody present who could make a presentation in a court of law. I leave you to try to figure that out. But um, we were talking about the image, and I remember there was a discussion about the image of Petroni, whether we, she should be presented you know, as a nice person, as an ugly person, as a bad person, as a peaceful person. And you know, this is a problem we have when we try to give images to people we've never seen. And therefore, we have to build the image among not only the impressions we have, but the impressions we can imagine as to what um, the person was. And in the case of Petronil, um, so that we could move on, in the case of Petronil, the punishment that she went through in the pillory was akin to the type of punishment in this image that I'm going to show you right now. And that is the image, supposedly the image of a woman who talked too much and her punishment was to lock her mouth so that she could not talk. Now, the person who drew this and has been circulating it of late has an inscription below the 11th commandment of God to man. Blessed are the speechless that they might not find themselves in trouble. Now, this was written for that. But I'll tell you where I first saw that picture. It was in the balcony of a gentleman by the name of Mr. Colomb. That's all he was done. Colomb on uh, Manuel Street, where exactly where Raise Your Voice St. Lucia, the office is located exactly there at the bottom of the Caddy Hill. Mr. Colomb had that photograph in his balcony. Now, the name Colomb has a specific meaning 
in French in that it was the French for the overseer. Now, whether Mr. Coulomb was an overseer or whether he was called Coulomb because of how he dealt with his co-workers in Curacao, I don't know. But the image we have of Petronil is one that allows us to pay homage to her, and not what she looked like or didn't look like, but homage to who she is. And Jenya, you could tell us about what happened in Sufre on the 1st of yeah. August. So the concert in Sufre, again, gone into the community, we work with the Sufre Foundation and the Sufre Council in terms of shaping and putting the event together. And of course, we use most of the performers came out of Sufre, most of the, the persons who were doing the vending. So it became an activity in the community. And I must say, Sufre really took over the activity and embraced it. And um, it was really a pleasure working with them. Um, all of those persons on that committee, Glindia, and um, if I forget any names, it's because I can't remember now. And um, it really cements for me, and throughout this entire process, all of the agencies that we've been working with, the clear-cut sort of cooperation and understanding the vision of what we want to do. And, and so for me, Sufre, um, the concert started from afternoon and it went into the night and the crowds of people that were there, I mean, we had people from all over St. Lucia. And I think we ended at midnight and when we ended, I said, well, okay, great. I heard people walking up and saying, Miss, say that finish already? I'm like, <laughs> so it was really a celebration celebrating ourselves. Um, we had performer Afa Ale, who's from Sufre and um, really rallying people to that call of really understanding that we are actually celebrating this event and this, this concept of sort of reconciliation and unity amongst us all and working towards a common goal and we can do that. So this essentially was what it did and we have not done. We're going through to, it's a youth podcast. <laughs> Excuse me. But before we get there, why Sufre? Um, Sufre, yes, was our um, first uh, first capital, etc. But was there any other reason for Sufre the Freedom Concert part, in Sufre? Sufre is part of the three-year plan. Sufre, most people don't realize Sufre has a rich history. And in discovering that Sufre, I believe the Negma want to go over Sufre for one year. <laughs> Again, um, it's alleged that the resistance is led by Flor Boagayal. So Sufre has a lot of significance. We know that the Negmawa statue is in the square. And we wanted to highlight Sufre in that sense so people now get a sense of um, this place. We often look at it as a, um, what I would say, a, a sort of a tourist place. It's beauty. Driving volcano. A driving volcano. And pitons. <laughs> but it is really more than that. Sufre is deeper than that. And, and we need to understand that and understand our history and maybe understand, you know, those persons who, who live there and understand that uh, this is the legacy that that continues and in our third year um, in for this series in emancipation we want to go back to Sufre and do a reenactment and really connect with the community of the battle at Rabot yes the battle of Rabot so it's and also to sort of um, decentralize it's not only about castries but it's about the entire St. Lucia and that's what we'll be doing for the next three years to come empowering communities and empowering people um, I want to say something about um, I think I lost a train of thought um, Petroni is more than an iconic hero it is a symbol that um, our emancipation celebrations the emancipation is celebrated throughout the Caribbean of course you have all of these concerts and events but for us it is deeper than that it is unearthing our history and it is through these events and activities whether it's our educational outreach we have to unearth our history if it is not in our in books if it is not in our education system as yet it is to come 
then we unearth it another way and spread the message to people so we know definitely who we are and the calling of those slave names on Monday is significant and uh, understanding who we are and why we're here and I hope people notice that when those names were called you had 10 people with the same last names these were families and that's the reality that we have to come face to face with and understand that it's time for reconciliation. The Caribbean Ties exhibition is held, Caribbean Ties and the exhibition with OAS or Safa Lewis Davy is held in an unusual place. Um, people would have thought we'd have a nice hall. It's in the Anglican Church. Which and has its own history. Which has its own history and connection to slavery. But what better place than to do that? And this is a time for reconciliation. So this embodies what this is about. This is an awakening. And I think we have awoken people, um, all the comments on Facebook, all the buzzing, all the discussions between intellectuals about Petroni, the discussions about slavery, whether it's positive or negative. These are the discussions that what we, we want is that the narrative um, takes right, place. Continues uh, takes you mentioned place. the podcast, the NYC podcast. So the National Youth Council will be doing a podcast, really hearing what young persons have to say about emancipation, the raw truth, and getting their view and their perspective and channeling that message. There's a panel discussion going to be done by the Folk Research Center the dispensation of land after emancipation. Now, that is going to be a hot topic. And we're asking persons, you know, you need to understand what happened afterwards. It was more than 20 million pounds given to those um, plantation owners. What else was given to them? What about the people who work the land? So we have to face all of these things. Why certain areas <coughs> seem to be different and why large areas we say well this is um th these are not the owners locally but so we need to understand all of that and understand in terms of how do we go about managing 238 square miles of the present what we have and understanding that we have to appreciate what we have so apart from that the library is launching a project about oral history and of course, we will close off with the Laos Festival, which is over 100 years old, which came out of Savory and celebrated in Castries, August 30th, from 9 a.m. until 5 a.m. church service. And really, Laos Cabinet Castries. We. Say, Yoki Menela. They had said that um, they had not been to Castries for the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. And it's only fitting that we celebrate within the city of Castries. We're working closely with the Castries Constituency Council. Thank you to the mayor. Um, we're working with e um, events company who has been with us throughout all of these events, working in terms of executing and all of the other agencies who have supported us. So we're just inviting persons to come and be part, I will not say experience, but a part of a movement of social change. And that allows us to, before we go back to uh, uh, Madame Lily Soto, and uh, that brings us, it allows us to reintroduce the regional and international element of what we're doing in St. Lucia today and what is happening uh, in St. Lucia today. Because like I said, um, the, we have to put all of that within the context of reparations because we're looking at uh, a space uh, from the beginning of slavery to its supposed end and the result of which is all reparations. So when slavery started, um, when the, the royal family established the Royal Africa Company in whatever, whatever century uh, to start the transatlantic slave trade, which was not about racism, but was an economic means, a very, uh, a very fruitful economic means, what happened coming out of this was the that through the sort of responses like in St. Lucia between 1795 and 1796 when 
slavery was abolished for one year. Um, that was as a result of the influence of the French Revolution in 1789. So that uh, the, 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 the seven years after 1789, there was this revolt in St. Lucia, the battle at Rabot that destroyed, um, defeated uh, the British. They returned in 1789 and re-established um, slavery. Therefore, in 1804, the Haitian Revolution took place and abolished slavery forever through the creation of a constitution. Now, from 1789, the French Revolution, to 1804, the Haitian Revolution, there were so many instances of rebellion in Latin America and the Caribbean, the Americas and the Caribbean, uh, that the enslavers in Europe had to take note of it. And therefore, seeing that slavery did not have a future, they found a way to come up with abolition. Abolition in 1830 but conditional upon the supposed ex-slaves given free labor for another four years through apprenticeship. But we notice that in that period between abolition and apprenticeship, the Europeans were able to get enough time to arrange for indentureship so that you could have Indians to replace Africans providing the free labor that fueled the the uh, transatlantic slave trade, the so-called Middle Passage uh, from Africa to the Caribbean and the Americans, and the so-called Great Triangle that started in Britain, went to Africa, down to the Caribbean, and brought uh, the profits back up. So uh, slavery, emancipation, and indentureship all led to reparations and that is what reparations is all about it has internationalized the issue reparations is not only a caribbean thing it is a big matter in america as well where uh, for the uh, 2020 uh, presidential elections in the united states every one of the nine democratic candidates seeking the candidacy for the presidency had to have a public session on what they would do about reparations. And then came uh, the, George, the George Floyd uh, situation, uh, which um, snowballed the reparations movement in the United States. So reparations is being sought in the Caribbean, in the United States, and now Africa is on board uh, so that with the upcoming second Africa, African Union and CARICOM Summit on the 7th of September, which is going to be the second, we're going to most likely hear the extent to which the African Union is joining the CARICOM's call for reparations for slavery and native genocide. And I might also tell you that the CARICOM heads of government are also engaged with the government of India so that India could come in on the international reparations movement on behalf of not just the exploitation of India by the British Empire, but uh, the exploitation of the indigenous uh, Indians who were brought to replace the free labor in slavery as a result of which in St. Lucia, for example, we have specific Indian-oriented communities from forest here to Mark to Oje. So all of these are the issues we will be able to discuss during an emancipation month, but please let us not treat emancipation like carnival or like um, jazz and only get ready for it when it's coming. Emancipation and reparations are permanent and um, one of the recommendations that the, the National Reparations Committee is going to be making at the end of this is the creation of a permanent uh, committee, commission or transformation of the National um, Emancipation Preparations Committee into a permanent forum with a budget that operates throughout the year rather than waiting until July next year to plan for emancipation or wait until March next year to plan for um, observance of slavery. Having said all that, let us go um, to 
uh, Madam Lily Ching is so too. The OAS, like we said um, earlier, has been pleased to uh, participate in, contribute to, and be present at the various activities that we have been organizing in St. Lucia, um, particularly in the past year of your three years here. Um, when is all that falling within the context of the OAS charter? Because like you pointed out, the OAS is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, international organization, um, organization of nations. And um, in that context, um, I would hate to think that OAS participation here is just, is, is, is just because you have an interest. Um, tell us how it falls in within the OAS's uh, objectives. Let me say, well, I have a couple ideas or reactions that I would like to raise. Um, I'm going to try to organize them in a way that, that, that I explain myself. But when you speak about reparations, and you know this better than I do, one of the basic elements of reparations is guarantees of non-repetition. And for you to not have repetition, you need to be able to have Truth and reconciliation, right? So, in most of the in the world, the, the, the truth and reconciliation commissions, committees, initiatives always have the truth part of it. And I think that with these initiatives, CDF and the government of San Lucia is doing a great job into explaining or bringing. You know, there's two kinds of truths as well. The, the judicial, that is established by a court when you bring something to a tribunal, and also the historical. And I think that the historical truth, the way that it has been exposed to everybody, all of us, even when we're watching online the events and the, the stories that are coming out, I think it's a wonderful way of bringing awareness to truth, which is one of the elements of reparation. So I just wanted to say that, and that's really Thank from my you. human rights perspective. But uh, um, my second reaction, is with Petronie, and when you were saying, was she pretty, was she ugly, was she bad, was she? And then I would have to say, well, she was a person, right? And, and she was a holder of, of rights. And that is basically also what, where I'm going to connect with your question about the organization of American states and what do we do? Because as a, as a regional fora, um, the organization of American states, since establishment, long time ago, with the League of Nations and besides, um, we have had regional discussions, and and one of the strongest elements of the OAS is also the human rights standards that had been created. So, from the Charter and its origin to the Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Men to the American Convention on Human Rights, the celebration of the rights of people and the equality, the principle of equality, the non-discrimination, the rights of women, the, the, the rights of, it's something that we have at a political dialogue level on a permanent basis. Just like we have reparation, just like we have the right to truth. We, this is something that we have been discussing since, well, I haven't been since then, but uh, that, that the OES has been discussing since inception. So I think that this is totally related, and I think that one of the things that we also have to take into consideration when we speak about these big political organizations, regional organizations, is that when you have 35 member states, one of the main objectives for us to be able to work effectively is to bring cultures together while preserving their identity. So it is a task. You have 35 states. But I am delighted to be part of the initiative on, and the effort to try to bring cultures together while preserving their identity. And seeing San Lucia blooming with identity, and uh, not identity, expressions of cultural heritage that teach me about your identity is wonderful. So Historical thank you very truths. much. Thank you. Uh, we're running out of time. We have only five more minutes left. And of course, we will um, be looking for closing remarks from uh, each of our remaining panelists. Monsignor Anthony uh, had to uh, leave to uh, participate in an activity that he could not uh, have, um, have pulled out of. And therefore, folks, um, we are hoping that we have been able during this um, discussion uh, to bring you up to date with why reparations 
why emancipation, the connection between slavery, abolition, emancipation, apprenticeship, indentureship, and why all of that has led to the call for reparations for slavery and native genocide. And like we said earlier, the 9th of August is International Day for Indigenous People. The Organization of uh, American States has an activity planned. Uh, the National Reparations Committee will also uh, be engaging the OAS office and uh, the CDF in so far as how best we could not just contribute to Emancipation Month 2022, but to ensure that this movement that Paba spoke about, this movement that Ambassador Ching has spoken about, this movement, this enkindling, this um, enkindling of our consciousness, rekindling of our consciousness in the second year, and uh, reigniting that consciousness even further, reinforcing it in the third year. So uh, for our final comments, we will start again uh, with Madam Ching Soto. Uh, she will give us her final comments on OAS participation. Uh, in what we are doing here, and uh, Adrenia uh, will uh, hopefully uh, give us um, more reason to look forward uh, to the rest of Emancipation Month uh, 2022. Uh, Madam Ching, your closing remarks. Well, I would like to say thank you. Thank you on behalf of the Secretary General and the Assistant Secretary General of the OES and of the staff, because uh, you have allowed us to come close to you as a people and I am very um, and I am very excited and motivated to be able to to keep on working on this on these issues um, I wouldn't like to say a closing remark other than let's keep talking yes, I yes. would love to be able to continue the conversation so to me it is um, a challenge to learn more uh, it there's always a um, a reflection that comes from from these conversations and, and I was in Denary and listening to to the participants there's a lot of reflection to to be done and I am happy for your guidance I'm learning a lot and I am happy to be part of this so let's keep on talking thank you and uh, we look forward to your continuing assistance cooperation and uh, everything that you continue to do not only for us but with us because uh, we can see um, that you have like you said attended and participated in all of the activities from carnival to emancipation Jenya, uh the cdf creative director the lady in the driver's seat um your closing remarks i just want to thank um, everyone for coming out and participating, particularly the artistic community, the creatives um, who participated in all the activities and allowed their talent and their um, vision of how this will be put on um, to come to fruition. I, there are specific people, I'm not forgetting everybody, Tabu Mele, all the drumming groups, Lapo Kabuit, thank you for coming, more fire and Barry George, Trevor King, um, those persons who did stage management and our production people, our camera persons, um, all biz, everybody who worked towards creating this both in Denry and on Monday in um, Castries and in Sufre. Thank you to the creative community, the creatives, Afa Ale. Um, without your creative impetus, this would not be possible and create the impact that we, we really need. Needed. And of course, Naja Simeon for reading all those documents and coming up with an image of Petroni. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That is a gift. And, and to Mincel Fabier for giving us those three images that have formed part of our branding. Thank you. And it's really an outpouring from CDF to the artistic community. Let's continue to work together to create movement, create change, and everybody be part of the celebrations. Come out to support flowers, put on your television and be part of the discussion. That's it. 
And we want to thank each and every one of you out there for joining us today for what we hope will have been an informative, entertaining, and uh, educating uh, activity and exchange. We want to thank uh, Madam Lily Ching Soto. We want to thank uh, Jania Frederick, the CDF Creative Director. And on behalf of the uh, National Reparations Committee, we want to thank you for joining us. And we look forward to you not just continuing to uh, participate in the activities that have been scheduled, but also uh, to be ready to participate in those activities we might not have uh, prepared for, like August 9th, International uh, Day for Indigenous People, and August 31st, uh, the International Day for People of uh, African Descent, which really bridges the uh, gap uh, between the objective of the call for reparations for slavery and a native genocide. So we'll look at native genocide on August 9th, and then we will look at the people of African descent on August 31st. I'm Earl Buske. Until next time, do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.